Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today, I'm actually outside. I'm not pretending to be outside. I'm at the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge in North Florida, and behind me, that's a St. Mark's light. It was built back in the 1800s, and actually my ancestors were lighthouse keepers during the 1860 to 1880 period. It's kind of cool. But today, I picked this area to do my video on water. What's a better place than to talk about water than right on the Gulf Coast? And specifically, this is Appalachian Bay and my home county of Wakulla. I grew up just down the road from here. Now, today we gotta talk about water, you know? And what I wanna do is talk about why is water so important for life? And what are the properties of water that make it important for life? So, yeah, we're gonna do a little bit of chemistry. But before I dive into that, I just wanna say, I gotta do this, I can't help myself. We gotta do a little bit of astronomy. I know, I have astronomy envy. But think about this. We are right now in the golden age of exploration and astronomy. And in fact, in like two weeks, NASA's Perseverance probe will land on Mars. Of course, that's February 18th, today is the third, so almost two weeks, right? Pretty exciting. And it's going to be looking for signs of life on the red planet. Now, why do we think Mars has a life or had a life? Because there was liquid water on its surface in the past, and there may be liquid water on it now. But Mars might not be the only place in the solar system that we can find life. We may also find it on a moon of Jupiter called Europa. And in fact, we know that Europa's surface is covered in ice, and we're pretty certain that underneath that ice is an ocean of liquid water. And that's not the only place. Let's go further out. Let's go to Saturn. Saturn has a moon called Enceladus. Now, and before I talk about Enceladus, we've all known about Titan for years. Titan has an atmosphere. Titan has lakes, rivers, and it rains. It's the only other body in the solar system that has liquid on its surface and rains and lakes and rivers just like Earth. One exception, it's not water, it's hydrocarbons, it's methane and ethane. But there's this other moon, much smaller, it's called Enceladus. And look at the southern hemisphere. And if you notice, the southern hemisphere is covered in ice. There are no craters. Guess what? There's liquid water underneath it as well. And in fact, the Cassini space probe actually found fissures of water spewing out on that southern hemisphere. So we're pretty certain that there is liquid water on these planets and these moons like Enceladus and Europa. That's the question, right? Why liquid water? Why are scientists so excited about finding liquid water and that being good for life? Well, before I start talking about the properties of water, let me first talk about life and what life is. And then that will help explain why liquid water is so important for life. So we often ask the question, you know, what is life? Well, okay, is, so I'm applying this a noun, right? Uh, life is an emergent property of a complex system. That's kind of what life is, I know. That's not the definition you probably have ever heard before. So I like to ask the question, what does life do? Okay, we know that life is this emergent property. We're greater than the sum of our parts. But life, life takes in energy from the environment and uses that energy and building blocks to create order. You are an ordered system. You are not in equilibrium with your environment. So every living organism requires energy. The plants next to me, they're taking energy from the sunlight. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, water from their roots. And what are they doing? They're creating molecules, complex molecules with that, specifically carbohydrates. And then they use the energy and the carbs to go and make all kinds of other molecules. I'm an animal. I'm a, I eat plants. I eat animals. I eat everything. And basically, I get my energy from the foods that we eat. And so what we're doing as a living system is we are taking in energy and nutrients from the environment and creating order. We're creating complex molecules. And we do that through metabolic reactions. Now, I know chemistry. Metabolic reactions are the sum of all the chemical reactions in your body. 
breaking things down, building things up. And these chemical reactions, they need a median to occur in. If they did it in air, I mean, the air, oh my gosh, it, these air molecules move around way too fast to have enough complex reactions occur for life. If I did it in a rock, same problem, right? I mean, if I'm in a rock, then um, the molecules never come together. So we need a median for all of these chemical reactions of life to occur. And what's a better median than liquid water? Now the question is, why is water such a good median? So what I'm gonna talk about now are the properties of water that make it very conducive for life. We're gonna talk about it being a good solvent. Adhesion and cohesion is high heat capacity and also we'll talk about pH at the end. So let's jump right in. Water is a good solvent. Water is not a universal solvent, it's a good solvent. It can dissolve a great many things. The ocean out here is salt water. You can't drink it. If you, well, you can. You just get more dehydrated if you drink it. And the reason why is because it's got dissolved salts in it. Dissolved salts, sodium, chloride, and almost every other salt is out there. Calcium, magnesium, iron, you name it. Oh, the iron's not a salt. All the other electrolytes as well. The reason why water can dissolve a great many things that are considered hydrophilic, Hydro means water, phyle means loving. Water can dissolve hydrophilic substances because water is a polar molecule. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, polar means you got a plus in and a minus in. Now, you all know the chemical composition of water, the molecular formula, I know I use the word molecular, H2O. One oxygen attached to two hydrogens. And the way they attach to each other is by a chemical bond called a covalent bond. Co means with, valence has to do with the outside electrons. So they are sharing their outermost electrons, forming covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds are not all created equal. Some uh, are weaker, some are stronger. Sometimes the electrons are shared equally, sometimes they are not. Now, oxygen has this property called electronegativity. Think electro, electron, negative, electrons are negatively charged. Oxygen is highly electronegative. It loves electrons. And in fact, oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe, right? So oxygen pulls the electrons away from the protons, the hydrogens, and water. And it creates a bond that's sharing those electrons unequally. So the electrons spend more time near oxygen. That makes the oxygen end of that molecule partially negatively charged. Since you're pulling the electrons away from the protons, guess what? They become partially positively charged. Ah, right, we got a plus end and a minus end. And as a result, that creates a situation where water can attract to each other, right? Other water molecules stick to each other. We can see that out here in the ocean behind us and they can form hydrogen bonds, which is these weak attractions between molecules that are other molecules that are polar or have partial charges on them. So what that means is water can dissolve ions and salts. So sodium and chloride is a salt, it can dissolve it. Water can also dissolve these hydrophilic substances. Remember, hydrophile, hydrophilic, water loving. So like carbohydrates, right, sugars. You ever had a soda? It's got like 39 grams of sugar dissolved in it. Why? Because sugar dissolves in water. So water can create a good medium. It can dissolve a lot of things to allow all these chemical reactions of life to occur. So that's important. That's the most important aspect of water, right? Water creates a median for life's chemical reactions to occur. That's awesome, isn't it? Okay, so that's the number one reason why we look for liquid water. Liquid water, you need it for life. Life needs it. Now, if we go to Titan and we find life on Titan, it won't be water-based chemistry, and it would be astoundingly different from anything we've ever seen. I, I don't even know if it could happen. I, it would be the most, one of the most amazing discoveries ever is finding life on Titan. Liquid water, there you go. It's a great solvent, provides a median for the chemical reactions of life to occur. Water has other properties 
that are related to this, um, to its polar nature. One of those is adhesion and cohesion. I guess that's two. Adhesion, water sticks to other substances. I'm wearing blue jeans. I mean, blue jeans aren't that great for, you know, getting wet in because water sticks to blue jeans. My blue jeans are made of cotton. Cotton's made of cellulose. It's carbohydrate, totally hydrophilic. So if I walked out there, I'd get wet and I'd get cold. Now, the other property of water is cohesion. Think like a cohesive group, they stick together. Well, this liquid water out there is a property of cohesion. Water molecules stick to each other. Now this is important for things like these plants. These plants can move water from their roots to their leaves and not spend any energy. And the reason why is the water molecules will stick to the water conducting vessels inside the plants, stick to themselves and stick to the inside of the plants and the water will evaporate out of the leaves and it literally sucks it up like a straw right up out of the ground. That's kind of cool. So that's adhesion and cohesion. Another important property of water is that it has a high heat capacity. Now, um, you've seen high heat capacity, right? You, you're hungry, you gotta boil up some ramen noodles, right? Well, you gotta boil the water for your ramen noodles. Put the pot on with all your water, turn it on, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting with this pot ever, please boil, thank you. Yeah, that's because water can absorb a lot of energy before it changes temperature. And in fact, we have a measurement for that. It's called the calorie. One calorie will raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. So water can absorb a lot of energy. And in fact, um, living near the coast, I'm aware of it all the time. And uh, I started off this morning and it was cold. And let's take a look at the trip down here. So water has a high heat capacity. And uh, here we are, we're about five miles inland. And you can see it's 34 degrees. And let's head down to the coast where the water temperatures are about 56 degrees. And we're gonna cross the St. Mark's River here at Newport. There's some deer hanging out by the road. There's one wandering off in the woods. Now we can see the lighthouse. And now you can see the temperature is 40 degrees. It's a full six degrees warmer down here at the coast. So if you noticed, at my house in the morning, it was like 30, it was actually down to 30 degrees. And then at the coast, it was closer to 40. There was almost a 10 degree difference. Why is that? Well, you see, right now it's pretty sunny. It's sunny outside. And the Gulf is absorbing energy right now. And as it's absorbing energy, it's keeping it from getting warmer than it is at my house. Now at night, because it absorbs energy all day long, it releases that energy into the atmosphere at night and keeps it from getting as cold. So it was warmer here at night and it will be cooler throughout the rest of the day. So that's important for moderating global temperatures. And it's also important for individual organisms because I'm not freezing immediately upon going outside when it's cold and I don't immediately overheat the minute I go outside when it's hot because my body's uh, temperature is gonna be modulated by the high heat capacity because I'm mostly water. Now, there's one other property of water we gotta talk about and that is the pH. I know, more chemistry, potential of hydrogens, right? So if you recall, the important property of water for life is that it creates a median for all the chemical reactions of life to occur. So if you start affecting the chemical reactivity of that median, you can see a problem, right? So even though a water molecule, H2O, is held together by these strong covalent bonds, every now and then they do come apart. The hydrogen pops off one and you get a hydroxide ion and you get a hydrogen ion, which is basically a proton. Now, I know for all you chemistry buffs out there, protons don't really exist totally by themselves. They're hydronium ions. So uh, let's not go there. But at any rate, if you have a neutral pH, 
the amount of hydrogen ions equals the number of hydroxide ions. It's like one in 10 million. So it's not too much. Now, if I make water more acidic, I increase the number of my hydrogen ions and the pH goes down to seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, incredibly acidic. You don't want to get with acid of one on you. It will eat through your skin. Go the opposite way. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm decreasing my hydrogen ions, but I'm increasing the hydroxide ions. And recall these ions are reactive. They can make and break chemical bonds. They can change the shapes of proteins. So the physiology of life, my cells, for instance, all those chemical reactions are geared. They've evolved to occur at a very specific range of pHs. The ones in my stomach, they work at a low pH. The ones in my intestines work at a slightly alkaline pH. You change the pH, those proteins no longer function. And in fact, your blood maintains a very narrow range of pH. If it becomes too acidic, you have acidosis. If you become too alkaline, you have alkalosis. And either one can be fatal. Not only is pH very important for individual organisms, from myself to uh, bacteria living in the soils or in water or on rocks, it doesn't matter, but our oceans. Our oceans also have a set pH of around 8.2. They are slightly alkaline. This is very important because as I told you, seawater is like 35 parts per thousand salts and other minerals, including calcium carbonate. So a lot of animals, like oysters, snails, and corals, they take calcium carbonate out of the water and then they make their shells with them. The problem here is this global climate change thing. I know there's global climate change, it's affecting everything. But as we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it gets absorbed out there in the ocean. As carbon dioxide becomes absorbed into the oceans, it forms carbonic acid and the carbonic acid is lowering the pH of the oceans. And what that is doing is making it harder for snails and mussels and scallops and oysters and all these corals to take the calcium carbonate out of the water and make their homes out of it or make their shells. This is a real problem for diversity. There's like over 100,000 species of snails. And most of them rely on making their shells out of calcium carbonate. Coral reefs are incredibly diverse. They're like oasis out in the desert, right? They're, they're these structures made up by these animals called corals, and uh, they account for about 1% of the ocean surface, almost 1%, but they also account for half, nearly half of the ocean's diversity. So think about that. Nearly half of the ocean's diversity is found on less than 1% of its surface on these coral reefs. And as the oceans become more acidic, guess what? Those coral reefs are, it's harder for the corals to form those reefs, greatly negatively impact diversity going forward as our oceans have become more and more acidic. And in fact, in the past, when we look at mass extinctions, acid oceans or acidic oceans, ones that are not alkaline, have been associated with great die-offs of marine, of marine creatures. And live today from St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge, I well, hope you enjoyed this. This has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.